Yo, Timbo, I got you, nigga. How is that? For the culture, face on the one that poster. For the coca, Jake pull a nigga over. He a soldier, say he did it for the culture. Yo, peace world, I want to welcome y'all to another episode of For the Culture, man. This week we got Chango, formerly of the YTC, which was the Yellow Top crew, which is an infamous crew out of New York. Now, the first question I have for you is, can you tell us a little bit about where you was born and raised and give us a little background on your childhood, if you don't mind? What's happening? God bless you. I was born in Puerto Rico. My mother brought me to New York at a very young age, the age of three months, for life-saving surgery. That's how I made it to New York City. For the very first time and we were very poor and we were here in new york we me myself my brother my sister my mother my mother's always been a single parent so now we were in new york in the 70s struggling and we struggled between uh shelters and homelessness and other people's cribs and other people's living room floors and no different than people still and young kids are doing today so Yo Chango, can you go into detail a little bit on what was it like growing up in Manhattan in the early 80s? Was it always a, a strong Latino presence My you was growing up? Growing up in the 80s on Columbus Avenue, it was uh, populated mainly by Dominicans. I mean, I really didn't know what these all, all these people were up to, to tell you the truth, my brother, but I knew it was something illicit. I lived on a building 106th Street in Columbus Avenue, 932 Columbus Avenue, apartment 3S. And from there, you know, playing the window, I used to see everything. But when you live in a neighborhood like that, or like many in New York City that are like that, what else do you see? You got drugs at home, drugs outside, drugs in the building, drugs in the mailbox, drugs in the bodega, drugs everywhere, man. Again, you become desensitized and that's, that becomes the norm. So I saw a lot of that. I was recording it in my mind. It wasn't a plan to record, you know, but I know now when I sit back and meditate, I know that all that I saw, I repeated. I just repeated it on steroids, meaning to the max, because um, what we did out there, nobody did before and nobody has ever done since. I don't say that like that's a positive, that's a big ugly on every front, but that keeps happening, man, and it could keep happening. Poverty, bro. Poverty, man, strong thing. Now, Chango, can you tell us about Tito and who he was, and how did you guys meet? Tito's my brother from another mother. We met as adolescents, bro, you know, on Amsterdam Avenue. We had one thing in common. We wanted money, and that's the one thing that got us going. We started to sell weed on Amsterdam, and that was slow money, so we, we tried coke, but it was too slow. So then we jumped onto the crack, and in between all of that, we was trying to get uh, as much knowledge as we could from Maketumba. Maketumba was a dope dealer from the Lower East Side, man, but he lived uptown. He liked what he saw in us, that we was hustlers, and he started fucking with us, and that was it. Now we started learning the dope game from him. So would you say that Maketumba was very influential with you guys going that way, as far as the streets, and as far as fucking with the dope and all that? Was meeting Makatumba like the turning point in you guys' life? Or do you think you guys would have been the same people that you turned out to be without meeting Makatumba? Good question. The truth is that what we learned, we learned from him. We just switched it into a different game. As far as shooters and all that, also learned from him. As far as using Lynn Stewart to fight cases, also from him, she was his lawyer. That's how she became my lawyer. You know, so all these things were learned through an apprenticeship that we were going through with him, whether we knew it or not, you know? But at the end of the day, all these things that we learned were horrible. Now, I'm glad you said that about the things that you learned from him it was actually detrimental in the long run. Is it safe to say that Makatumba was like your big homie? He was like your OG. But, so these kids don't get fantasized with that these days. Now, looking back on those times as a man, as an older man in a different mental mind state that, than you was in at, at that particular time, can you explain to the kids how they might look up to someone as an OG, but in all reality, it's just an older person manipulating the mind of someone younger and more impressionable and manipulating them with that negative um, energy and just directing them to do things that's actually detrimental. Can you explain that part of it? The entire drug game is a manipulation. From the minute the coke is compressed and leaves, it's manipulation. 
So you gotta know that if you're playing that game, right? Any older dude, be it OG or not, that's putting drugs in a younger man's hands, is manipulating him. But the young man also is manipulating the old timer because at that stage he's trying to come up and he's already learning that that's what he has to do. Uh, speaking for myself, I wish, bro, that I had not had so many young people around me. I was young also, I was 20 years old. When I see the people from then and I see the positions that they are in today through YTC and, and the hood, it's heartbreaking, bro. You know, everybody puts up the tough face and, and comes outside with their best shirt, bro. But you know who's, who's struggling, and, and rightfully so, you know, the game breaks your back. One way or the other, it breaks your back. Now that we on the subject of manipulation, now we all know in the media lately, you've seen all the um, things going on with um, Takashi 6 ix 9 And then you also see um, guys like Rallo, um, guys like AR Ab. You know, these guys go on these shows and they, you know, incriminate themselves or whatever the case might be. And then you have these guys going to jail, man, and the feds swooping in on these guys, man. What's your take on all that that has been going on as of lately, coming from an era where there wasn't no internet and there wasn't no social media and these type of things didn't happen? What's your take on the things that's going on now and the guys putting themselves in bad situations because of things that they've done and said on social media? I think the internet is the new crack. You got dudes wilding out. You got people now that'll kill you for views. You know, you run up on a guy and you stab a dude, you don't know where the fuck that knife is gonna land at. And maybe if you would have done time before, motherfucker, then you would know. Nowadays, kids just make bigger and bigger mistakes, man. A lot, of, a lot more kids today are making adult mistakes about what? People killing each other over blocks still, but it ain't about no money. It's about who lives there and who lived there before that and who can't cross the street. You know, there's a lot of rappers, man, that have a fascination with uh, street life. You know, I had a, a friend, Myrna Santana, who, um, rest in peace, um, loved the street, man. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful soul. Beautiful young man and with a promising career. So there's people that just love the street, bro. And it's all about wanting that um, street credibility. But at what cost? Now you got real street problems, you know? I've never committed crimes that didn't um, involve profit. So I wouldn't understand why would you be flashing a gun to the world on the internet? What I wonder is, you ever heard of ATF, motherfucker? Now you mentioned Marilyn Santana. Now can you tell us about your relationship with the actor, Marilyn Santana, and when and how did you meet him? And was he a, a member of YTC or was he just a friend? Marilyn Santana was a friend and uh, you know, a kid on the block on 107th Street. And uh, when I was upstate, we stayed in communication. He was living in Studio City in California, and he was actually shopping my script, pitching it here and there. Uh, he was supposed to play me in the script. Merlin Santana, had he had been allowed to reach his maximum potential, was gonna be a force in Hollywood, you know? He had it, you know? Where was you when you heard, when you got the news that um, Merlin had been killed? How did you feel when you got that news? I was in Dannemora, Clint Correctional Facility, when um, I got that news that Murder Santana was killed. And it was kind of surreal because I'm thinking, killed for fucking what? What could he be killed for, you know? I'm thinking this kid survived hanging out with us and being around us. He was actually in some of our surveillance tapes that, that, that uh, were taken of us through all our investigation. He survived all of that. He got out the hood and he got killed in L.A. To me, that was like, what? But, God rest his soul, man, that's what happened. Now, some of that persona that he brought to the television show that he was on with um, Steve Harvey, would you say that some of that swag and that persona that he put on in that television show, would you say that he got that from hanging around you guys? Or was he just that type of person naturally on his own? Bernard Santana would drive around Columbus Avenue in the drop top that he had at the time, smoking blunts, and in the back seat would have five, six, seven different scripts of possible uh, jobs that he was gonna take on different projects, whether they were feature film or, or TV screen, you know? But he had um, super, super, super extra, super extra swag and, and a lot of love to give and a lot of, a lot of love to receive, man. Me, it was a, 
a privilege, man, to be able to call them randomly whenever I wanted to while I'm serving time in Clint Correctional Facility. And I really, really appreciated that because I knew, you know, that I'm calling a guy that has a job. No matter how you look at it, he got a job, and he got a life, and he's out there, and he's removed from all that shit that, that we had done, you know? And um, here he was trying to help me push the script and giving me full access to him, to his publicist, and to his uh, manager. So, you know, you appreciate that. Well, if, if you appreciate things, you appreciate that, you know? Now, bro, you mentioned being in um in Clinton Correctional Facility in Danamora, right? The world knows that that was one of the prisons that um Tupac went to. That was one of the prisons that Shine went to. Now, did you ever get a chance to meet them while you was in prison? What when they came to while you was doing your bid? Did you have any interactions with them? I'm familiar with that you did have some type of interaction with Shine. Can you go into detail about that? Yeah, I was in the same place that Pac was, but. Um, I never met him. I got there after he left. Um, I was there with old DB um, from Wu Tang and with Sean. Sean was in the cell next to me, and um, Sean loved loved playing ball, but he don't pass that motherfucking rock. <laughs> God bless him. So he he um, we were, all I could say about him is that man, we was eating rice and beans and fried Jack Mac every goddamn day that we could. That's it. I used to kick it to Shine late night, man, because we were, you know, cell to cell. So we would be on the cells talking and on, on the gate talking, and um, you know, he'd be rapping and putting me on to new music that he was writing. At the time, he had five songs for the YTC project, and the people that he had listed to join him on the projects to me was very interesting. And I never even got to tell him that. I don't know why. I, you know, I, obviously, I thought we were going to be around each other for a longer amount of time. You know, he was always talented, obviously. As far as um, ODB, a funny story is that um, I'm one of the first people that got him on the phone, not because um, I was running the phone, but because it was my turn to use the phone. And he had just got there, and he needed to let his people know, you know, that he touched on and where he was at. And so I did him the solid. I gave him my slot. And... Maybe two, three weeks later, this the same thing. I'm trying to get this project going, and I wanted to know if he could plug me in with um, anybody from Wu that was, you know, doing film. And, um, you know, like RZA, you know, he's, he's uh, uh, RZA's a genius in many ways. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm right here with ODB. Let me see if I can communicate with this dude and, and network, you know? Your network is what? Your net worth, right? So... Um, I yelled up to his cell. He was in the company above me, on Five Company, and Lower H Block, um, which is also known as APPU. And I told him, yo, come outside. He's like, for what? And I said, so we could talk. He said, I get paid to talk. And words of mother, we ain't never have that conversation that I wanted to have, bro. I said, oh, shit, that's some gangster shit this motherfucker just said to me because it's true. He's a rapper. He get paid to open his mouth. There was this ugly as fuck CEO that would come by um, ODB cell and sing songs that he would have, you know, playing on everybody's TV because it's a TV jail, you know? So you could hear um, BT playing in mostly everybody's fucking cell. And when she come through giving the mail, she'll be, oh, give me money, give me money, ooh, ooh mocking him you know is that professional is that correct is that positive is that rehabilitative what i don't understand that bro you know it's just insulting listen man a lot of rappers right and this this has nothing to do with the people that we just spoke about right this is this is just in general you could just pick whomever you want you know a lot of rappers it don't matter if it's east coast west coast down south what are you doing running around with AK-47s and AR-1s and what for? <laughs> like you, you running around like you down with the cartel. I mean, I never understood that if you're getting legitimate money, you got to be in the streets too. For what? It used to be a thing that if you make dirty money, you clean it by getting out of the streets, right? Nowadays... Dudes get a million dollars signing bonus and buy all their friends an AK-47 and, and 
and an iPhone and go on an IG live chat and rant. For what? It's like people who are becoming slaves to their lyrics, bro. And then they're becoming slaves to the character that they are advertising and promoting. And then they're becoming prisoners to that name, only to then lose everything, everything, and become a number again. For what, bro? Now, Chango, we know that you was a bad motherfucker in Harlem at one point, and one, once upon a time. It seemed like the gang culture is like fashion. It's like, you know, you put on a rag to go with your outfit, and, and that's what it is. You, you know what I mean? Explain to the people, man, did you see the change from being in prison since the 90s? You know what I'm saying? Did you see the change in the gang culture within the prison system in New York City? As far as what I was told and, and things of that nature, it was only like Latin King, five percenters and muslims at one point in time those were like the three main gangs in the jail did you witness that transition and what was it like i come from the days when motherfucking ghost shadows was whipping police ass on rikers island and flying dragons were whipping police ass little asian motherfuckers was whipping ass whipping ninja turtles ass on rikers island as far as the gang culture in prison at the time and in jail, two separate places, jail you go to for a little bit of time and prison you go to for a long time. I saw a lot of yellow, blue, and red. That's what I saw at the time. There was a big war between yellow and red in prison. And, and it was serious, you know? There was a time when North Facility dudes' mothers was getting cut on a visit. And you know, obviously, man, that's like the super violation. You mentioned about a dude's mother getting cut on the visiting floor. Now, there's a dude that I heard of, I'm not gonna mention his name, but he's a was a high-ranking member of the um of the, of the Bloods from Staten Island, if I'm not mistaken, that I was heard that his mother got cut on a visit, which is a super violation. Like, like I mean, like, I don't understand like how a person, like, how can you be that angry to take something out on the person's mother? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, where does that type of shit come from? Like, Yeah, and it's happened more than once. And um, it's never justified. And sure, it has something to do with pent up anger. However, uh, there ain't that much anger in the world that'll let you act like a savage when you know you got a mom's too and you know you don't want nobody to do that to your mom's, bro. I know another guy, bro, that was cut. You know, at the time, a lot of people were getting initials written onto their faces with razors. You know, tag team, three guys holding one guy down and, and writing LK all over his face with a razor. So those stitches, that's what they're gonna spell, LK, you know? That shit is all savagery shit, bro. You know, at the end of the day, um, we cutting and stabbing each other. We all look like each other. And we all have an aunt that her name is Cookie and she's crazy and she lives in the Bronx. And we all got the fat aunt that cooks every fucking Thanksgiving and, and Christmas. And just everybody just going crazy on each other for what? <laughs> now, it was rumored to say that you guys at the YTC control a 12 block radius in, um, in Manhattan's Upper West Side at the peak, at the peak of y'all run on the streets. They said that, you know what I'm saying? Y'all had like 50 members. Y'all had a 12 block radius on Smash. How the fuck was you able to, to maintain that type of shit or, or, or be, not even maintain it, to be like the top dog of that type of crew into the shit that y'all was into at 20 years old? And the reason I say that, because I got, look, I got an 18 year old and I couldn't imagine him, you understand what I'm saying? I couldn't imagine him into those type of things at the age he is now with me knowing, you know, his, his level of maturity and, and shit like that, man. Explain to the people, man, how you was able to do that, man, at, at such a young age, man. Right, I'm gonna do my best to answer those questions, but I, I have to uh, premise first with saying that I am not um, promoting that lifestyle or uh, glorifying that lifestyle. I'm not answering these questions with any negative, I hope, influence on anyone. Because uh, what we did was dark, bro. Anytime that you could uh, feel okay with prospering while thousands and thousands of people are addicted to what you're selling, you ain't living right. When you know that 
all these women are selling their bodies and giving themselves as little value as five dollars to be intimate with a man in order to buy a crack. You know, you like the motherfucking devil, bro. You could clean yourself up. You could wear your jewelry. You could drive your cars. You could do all that shit. You could play the part, bro. But it don't matter if you were poor and you had to do this shit to come up and now you're in the game and you, you're doing you. That ain't really a justifiable excuse to enslave 10,000 other motherfuckers, you know? So we gotta call it what it is, and that's what it is, man. It's an ugly business, but it ain't really something to romanticize about or aspire to be. Like I said earlier, uh, what helped us is what we learned from Magadumba, man. The structure, the organization, the the the, the lawyering, the the shooters. You know, we, we put our own blueprint together. But again, all that was devil work, also, bro. Because at the end of the day. If I'm trying to um, climb up out of poverty and the only way to do it is by fucking a whole lot of other households up, man, is it worth it? Hell to the no. If I don't say that, then I would be perpetrating the fraud of continuing to, to give the game an allure that it doesn't deserve. We also know that you spent a lot of time in Clinton Correctional Facility, which is, if I'm not mistaken, is in Danamora which um, housed some prisoners like the Son of Sam. The Son of Sam was my neighbor for three years, David Berkowitz, God bless him. And um, I can tell you this, if nobody in the entire prison got mail, for whatever reason, he gets mail. And he gets marriage proposals. And he gets a lot of respect from both inmates and cops and convicts. He's a decent man. He's not into no bullshit. He's about his word. He's about the church. He's about God. And he's consistent with that. And he has been for 30 years or more. He tutors. He helps. He lectures. He's in the Bible every day. He's in church every day. He's a very kind neighbor. He's a very considerate neighbor to me, to many. He does not make light of the things that he is responsible of. He does show remorse. He is not clapping in front of the TV and chilling like everything is all right. He carries with him the weight of the things that he's done. And man, he's doing the best that he can do. That's what I got to say about uh, Dave. I was with Artie Shawcroft also, another serial killer. This motherfucker's bugged out though. You know, he would tell me that I don't know nothing about eating pussy. And I know that's a damn lie, for sure. But he would say it because he actually literally was killing women, cutting their vaginas off, and eating them, frying them up and eating them. But um, he's just a weirdo, bro. You know, it's another serial killer that got a lot, a lot of mail, a lot of attention from the outside. I had to work with him, and I used to work with him by him staying on one side of the room and me staying on the other side of the room. I've been with everybody that you could think about. I got arrested within the 80s and the 90s and had to do state time in maximum security prisons. People you read about in the newspaper were my neighbors. I was upstate with a dude that was responsible for surveilling John Gotti, and he was a federal uh, FBI agent, and he was in a cell right below me on two company and low age block. Think about that. You gotta watch what you're doing, man. A lot of kids think it can't happen to them, but guess what? I've seen prisoners who are quadriplegic in a cell. If you got a heartbeat, you could do time. Now, Chango, you played a key role in the Central Park Five case. For those that are unfamiliar with the case, in 1989, five black and Latino teenagers from Harlem who were wrongfully convicted of raping a white woman in New York City Central Park. In 2002, another man, a convicted rapist and murderer, confessed to the assault. And his DNA matched the semen that was found on the victim. Now, the Central Park Five were exonerated. In 2014, New York City paid them $41 million settlement. Now, can you tell the viewers how you helped the Central Park Five gain their freedom, bro? And how key you was and instrumental you was in those guys being able to come home and start families and pick up their lives again. When I got to Clinton Correctional Facility, also known as Down Amora, 
Well, a lot of people may be familiar with Hannah Moore now because of the, his series on Showtime about the escape. One of the first people I spoke to was Matias Reyes, who was known as the Eastside Rapist and who was doing time for murder and for rape. And he was brutally honest about himself. And that's all it took for me to know I'm gonna be this dude's friend, bro. And me being his friend just required me listening and talking to him and walking with him and dealing with him without judgment and he appreciated that. And that allowed us to form a friendship, a bond. And however I could help him, I helped him, bro. Every day, what's up, you know? He deserved it, I saw that he was struggling. You don't wait for somebody to drown before you jump in the pool to save him, you know? You see them struggling, you help them. So that led to trust, and trust allowed him to pose a question to me once about helping him. And he was interested in, you know, exonerating at least the name, because there were only two of the gentlemen um, in prison at the time. But he wanted to clear the names of the people who were in jail, in prison, for what he did. And then he admitted to me that it was the rape of the Central Park job case. I've always been an avid reader and I've always read the newspaper. And so anybody that mentions to me something like that, I'm familiar with it because I read about it back in the days, even as a young. So it took some time. We talk and we walk, we talk and we walk. And it was a hard decision to make because I'm already so deep into my bid and just looking forward to parole. And this is gonna attract attention. It's gonna might bring problems. I'm dealing with my own problems. People are gonna look at this suspect because I'm helping this dude and he's known for this. Anyway, he needed help, man. I had the lawyer, I had unlimited phone time, I had access to the phone, I, I didn't have to worry about a phone bill. At the time, those phone calls were like $20 a pop. I knew that this is a way to right some of my wrongs. Simple as that, bro. That wasn't an easy thing to do because I had to go against the grain. I had inmates that were with me that were writing letters to the CIA, the FBI, the district attorney, inspector general, just lying, saying that this is a scheme I was making up and that I was just doing this for lawsuit money and to give me a lie detector test. And then I had a task force that would visit me and pull me out of my cell to threaten me with keeping quiet. And then there was another group that would come and they trying to figure out um, what's the truth because they're interested in clearing them and so in between all of that then I got my situation with parole I'm um, going to the radar and it was just a decision that I had to run and run and run out in the yard run and run and run and thinking run and run and thinking headphones on run and run and thinking until I said yo I just got to do the right thing and that's what I did I don't look at it like no um, big deal for me but it is a big deal for the recipients because I'm glad they got their life back bro the right person became available in the right place to help the right guy in order to help the other five guys. Butterfly effect. If I don't do that, nothing would have moved because nothing been moving and nothing had been happening. And they definitely gave a whole lot of resistance to me and to Lynn Stewart. So imagine a guy that didn't have that radical lawyer that don't give a fuck and she's going to be demanding answers. Why did you help the CP5? You just down on the downside of your bed. You know, you're trying to see parole. You're trying to come home. What made you find it in your heart to want to help them guys that you didn't even know? The reason for helping, originally, I was not helping the CP5. I was helping Matias Reyes. Yes, of course. I was helping them by proxy because they were gonna be the recipients and the beneficiaries of the help. The bottom line is, bro, I'm responsible for a few murders. I'm responsible for an estimated, an accounted, a quantified 15,000 to 20,000 bottles of crack being sold daily from six in the evening to six in the morning, bro. I know the destruction that that left behind. I am keenly aware of the amount of things that I have to do in order to feel better about myself. And so all I'm doing is doing those things. Everybody has to look at themselves in the mirror. I want to look at myself in the mirror and I can criticize myself, be critical of myself, but I can also pat myself on the back and know I'm taking steps, man. It's also public information that they were paid. A couple of them guys was paid $41 million, man. Do you feel that? They should have looked out for you or, you know, because me, my personal opinion, you know, if it wasn't for you, those guys wouldn't have gained their freedom when they did. Those guys wouldn't have been exonerated the way they were. In my opinion, yes, of course, that's worth something to me, you know, but I guess everybody doesn't think like that. 
Many people, many people tell me that, bro. I've had lawyers tell me that. I've had uh, uh, people on the inside tell me that. I've had people on the outside tell me that. I had a parole officer tell me that. I've had different people. I had people in the media tell me that. A lot of people, the first question is, them dudes, they ain't look out? It's kind of starting to even bother me, man, because I don't know, man. I mean, maybe I look like I need to be looked out for. Shit, goddamn. I understand it to be a legitimate question, though. When people hear about what happened or know about what happened, they want to hear the ending and they want to hear like, yeah, they want to end it with a yeah. And they can't end it with a yeah, you know? It's worth something to me too, you know? I just don't want to muddy the waters with the good that I did because never in my mind or, or, or never in any of this was ever the idea of being compensated for it, you know? I, nobody owe me nothing because nobody borrowed nothing from me. Nobody owe me nothing because nobody offered me nothing. Nobody owe me nothing because I didn't make a deal with nobody and had them renege. It wasn't that kind of a thing. Should they have looked out? I think so. I think so, bro. I'm a guy just like them without forty-one million dollars. I'm a guy that whose criminal record is atrocious, my brother. I'm a guy who's um who's trying to make it, but they don't know if I'm a guy that's homeless after doing all that time. They don't know if I'm in a shelter. They don't know if I'm hungry. They don't know nothing. And that's what bothers me. But it don't bother me no more because I figured this out, that those dudes weren't from the streets. Them guys ain't from the streets, man. And so since they're not from the streets, they don't know what that shit is worth. To them, fuck it. Whatever dummy got in the middle of this shit and helped us out, it's about time. But they don't know what that's worth. So how could they value it, you know? They don't know that that was a prayer that was answered. So why don't why wouldn't you come and why wouldn't you be intrigued even to ask a question or or wonder who was it? That just makes me feel like they consumed with self and that's it. I me personally, bro, the way we do things from where I'm at, with a situation like this, bro, I would have bought a bag and been like, yo, here, you motherfucker would have had to take it because I wanna walk away knowing I did the right thing for somebody and that the person that helped me in that way and is allowing me to flourish and continue to go forward with sky's the limit, I want to know that I left some crumbs behind for them. Even if it's a fucking job, right? <laughs> Something. Everybody's always asking the same questions, man. It's always the same answer. And every time I give the same answers, the same reminder, uh, people just don't appreciate a motherfucker, man. You know? It takes a certain kind of man to put things together. Most people won't get involved, bro. And maybe that's what will happen now, you know? Once people learn the story in the future, people won't get involved. They'll, they'll remember, what the fuck I'm gonna get out of this? You remember Chango? <laughs> now, Chango, are you familiar with um, Ava DuVernay? She's directing a TV miniseries based on the, um, the CP5 case. You Have you heard of her? It seemed like you played a huge role, man, in those guys being released. Has she reached out to you for your input on the project that they're working on? Have they reached out to you maybe to be an advisor or anything of that nature? The answer is no, emphatic no. I'm aware that Ava knows about me because different people within her own camp while she's been filming have spoken to her about me. But I never got a call and that's cool too. I'm already of the uh, party that you know, this is what I know, man. The people with the most are always the least to give. I would have appreciated a job from her. <sighs> what? People within her own camp on every level, you know? People that were acting, people that were advising, people that were part of the executive team, all that good shit. I've made my um, position aware to her. Now, it wouldn't be right for us, for us not to reach out to the husband of the late Mrs. Stewart. Now, Mr. Pointer has firsthand information on the case. Mr. Pointer was also an ex-Black Panther. He's also a political activist. Now, Mr. Pointer, can you tell the viewers about how Matias Reyes detailed the attack of the jogger to you when you visited him in prison? He says, I picked up a branch ran up behind her and knocked her down. And he can tell you this better than I can. And he said, there, go there. And he says, you're going to see a depression. And he says, I dragged her to the depression. And he said, when I started to rape her, he says, she was strong. 
and she was wrestling with me, and he says, I was scrambling around on the ground, and he says, and I found a rock. He says, it was kind of brown, a triangular, but it was brown. He says, and I hit her. And he says, and that's why she has the marks. And I says, what happened to the rock? He says, when I knocked her out, I just threw it. He says, you will find the rock. You have to have two confessions that are similar. The confessions were all different, and they were all made up by the detectives who did the examination. And the woman who was the prosecutor, she knew they were lying. And though she got a promotion, these young men went to jail. It was a tragedy. Now, Mr. Point, another question I have for you is, how much involvement did you have in the case? Yusef's mother came to the office. Yusef called from Rikers Island. And because the guys on Rikers Island told him, you know, you need Lynn Stewart. Because Ben is not afraid of the government. And Lynn said, I will put New York City on trial because how did they come to this conclusion? They held this, they held them, um, and she says the case cannot be Lynn Stewart. The case must be these young men. And so she says, but let me, she called, uh, uh, Sharif Warren, Michael Warren, uh, and said, we have to put a team together. And I guess the facts uh, fall from there. That the team. Now, I said to Lynn, I really wanted her to take the case. I said, Lynn, you must. And she said, you know, I would love to take the case. But I know that the media, excuse me, folks, will do with this. The case will become Lynn Stewart. And she said, it cannot become Lynn Stewart. The rest is history. And Matthias, he knew he, he was the guilty party. These young men were done a terrible injustice. And um, and I say to Matthias, he said one thing for me. He says, I don't want anything. He says, but do not forget me. He says, I got no one. And I said, my problem is, if I send you money, it's like I paid for your uh, a statement. Right. Well, it's long enough, and I am guilty. I have right. never sent Matthias anything. And after this, I'm going to send Matthias the money. I may even go to visit him. Now, how important was Chango, a.k.a. Martin, which is Chango, how important was his persistence in getting Miss Stewart to even take the case at all? Martin's role was very courageous. Martin had problems of his own. But he did to call Lynn Stewart, and he, he been around a while uh, making a phone call to Lynn Stewart. It's uh, not too nice. And they knew, when I said I was there representing Lynn Stewart, uh, then they knew something, because all of the phone calls are recorded. They right. knew Martin did this. So Martin took a risk to call for help for Matthias. And I'm saying there's two young men show courage in the worst situation. You're you're locked down by a feeble, disgusting government and you dare tell the truth or go against with the government because he insisted when Lynn says, you know, I'm jammed, he said, you got to come here. And then Lynn finally said to me, Ralph, just get up there. You know, just, just go. And that's when I drove up to Plattsburgh to Denimore. I, I Listen, Martin can tell you this um, it was not a big thing. It was, I'd like to go see what Martin has to say. Yeah. He couldn't stand on the phone, but it wasn't, him, you know, it was important that Martin, and we knew he had time to serve, so how important could it be? I had no idea what this was about. Until, and then when I, when I heard it, it was like, holy mackerel, and here it is. What many people were suspicious of, that they rushed judgment, five different infections, confessions. And then the vile things that were in the press. It was a lynching all over again by the media. Uh, 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 Trump wanted the death penalty. You remember that? The dozen, you know, Koch was opposed. You know, it, it was a disgusting situation. And now we all know. Martin, mm -hmm. thanks mm -hmm. again for standing up. It took people of courage to make this happen. Lynn, when, when I told 
Lynn with Martin had said she knew of Martin's character. She says, this is, this is big. This is big, and I'm going to do whatever I can to see that these young men are exonerated. We did an interview with Gangsta Lou, right? Now, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with Gangsta Lou now, who was allegedly shot by a member of the YTC. Allegedly. What are your thoughts and feelings about Gangsta Lou? Yo, we never had no beef with um, Gangsta Lou or Alpo, AZ. None of them dudes from over there. <clears throat> and, um, you know, what happened with Gangsta Lou that night was actually a mistake. It was by accident. And since it was by accident, and since it was a mistake, it was regretted immediately. The gangsta Lou has to be respected, both as a gangster and a rapper. Now, we wanted to give y'all an example, man, of two people that had a problem at one point in their life when they was younger, two people that might have been gunning for each other or what have you. But we were trying to give y'all an example of how two people can have differences and be able to move forward without nobody getting hurt, without no violence, and just on some man shit. We're gonna have a gangster Lou tap in to show y'all, man, that people could really move past situations, man, in a non-violent fashion. Yeah, what's poppin', FMIs? Yeah, my nigga, I'm glad you hollered at me on this topic, you know what I mean? To let the young niggas know about war. You know, all war is the same war, you feel me? It's just the niggas that fight the wars that make war different. And, uh, I mean, as far as the situation with old boy and them, I mean, I know for a fact, you know what I mean? Them niggas didn't mean to shoot me, you know what I mean? Like, you know, the situation was a beef with somebody else and a nigga came and got me. And, you know, me just being me doing what a real nigga would do, you know, gripped up and went to the situation and wind up getting shot the fuck up real bad, you know? But um, as far as them, as far as they concerned, you know what I mean? I really don't have no animosity towards them boys, you feel what I'm saying? I mean, it's all good, you dig what I'm saying? It's war, street shit, you know what I mean? I respect that shit to the fullest, you know? I'm just really more mad that I got shot first, you feel what I'm saying? If anything, you know, like, yeah, like, you know. But, uh, yeah, nigga caught a nigga slipping, so, you know, yeah, that's what, you know, comes with the game, you know what I mean? But for all you young niggas, you know what I mean? War, yeah, like I said, you know, all war is the same, you know what I mean? It's just the niggas that fight these wars or that create these wars that make war different, you know what I mean? So I say that to say, like, you know, if you really like that and you really feel like you really like that or about that business like that, then keep it like that. In other words, you know, keep it in the streets. You know, like, yeah, like, you know, if you gangster, keep it gangster. If you thug, keep it thug. If you, you know, whatever you consider yourself to be you know what i mean just be that to the day you die you know what i mean yeah i want to you know give you a shout out my nigga you know give harlem bronx brooklyn all the boroughs you know the island you know what i mean manhattan house you know what i mean my little brother nice you know what i mean 145 saint nick 145 7th and 8th 144 7th and 8th you know what i mean all my billies my shines you know what i mean my apes you know what i mean all my homies you know what i mean yeah uh yeah all i can say is i'm glad that that man is all right i'm glad that you can still hear his voice I am mad that he ain't involved more in music that I'm listening to nowadays, but maybe that'll happen. I respect him enough to um, to keep it simple, man, and just appreciate that we could uh, leave those things in the past and stop living in the rearview mirror, you know? Now, Chango, my next question to you is, who is Lynn Stewart and what does she mean to you? Lynn to me was like a second mother and she used to call me her youngest. Our relationship was more than just me calling her when I got in trouble or hiring her for people that would get arrested that were committing crimes for me or for Tito. My relationship extended to her office after hours where I would just kick it with her, man, and talk about law and dream about becoming a lawyer myself because as a young man, that's what I would want it to be, a lawyer, a sort of people's lawyer, you know? I really didn't have the whole outline in my mind and knew that I wanted to be a criminal attorney or a corporate attorney, but I wanted to be a lawyer for the people. Knowing what I know now and having have learned what I have learned, I would certainly have selected to uh, follow Lynn Stewart's path. Whatever I needed, then was there for me, whenever. And there came a time where the judge didn't allow me to go to my sister's funeral who passed while I was um, in Brooklyn House. And Lynn went and represented for me, you know. In the beginning it was, oh, this is a big high power lawyer, you know, I know Lynn. But then I really got to know Lynn. And then the lawyer aspect of her was not the important part. 
Way after I was sentenced in upstate, I was still in contact with Lynn. Books were still coming to me from Lynn. But she also came on visits too, you know? Her husband, uh, Ralph Pointer, he was ex-Black Panther himself. He came on visits too. He was active with the Central Park Five case as well once I brought it to Lynn's attention because, um, you know, he's always been about that activism. Now, Chango, man, how did Lynn pass away, man? Lynn Stewart passed away from breast cancer. You know, Lynn Stewart got charged with the, with the shake case from the World Trade Center. And she went to trial and blew. But since she had such an outpouring of support, thousands of letters, I wrote one myself for her. She was able to get uh, sentenced to a lenient uh, 18 months. And then when she exited the courtroom, I mean the courthouse, and the press threw the microphone in front of her, they asked her how she felt about, you know, the sentence that she just received after having been found guilty. And she made a quirk that she could do that standing on her head. She could do that time standing on her head and she laughed about it. You know, it was just a quip. But they used that to show that she must not have no remorse and they ended up reversing the judge's decision to sentence her so leniently. And they ended up having her uh, sentenced to 10 years instead. And then while serving her time, she had a resurgence of a cancer. And they gave her six months to live and she was released under compassionate release. And you know, again, I'm in the crib hanging out with her, chilling, man, she's cooking, she's, that woman, She's helped so, so, so many people, man. So many people. Anyway, she died, man. They gave her six months to live, but she, she got three years out of it. And she died. God bless her soul. Now, we were all saddened by the recent news of the passing of um, the rapper from Los Angeles, Nipsey Hussle. What was your thoughts on that? Nipsey Hussle, man, now, that's a rapper I could respect. He was doing the things that I want to do. And I ain't talking about rapping activism, socialism, those are things that are worth being remembered for, you know, being legendary for. His music could come last compared to his heart. That's another dude that's dead, and now there's another dude running around waiting to get 25 years in prison. For what? And now you left some children behind that you made witnesses to the crime, and now you traumatize them forever. For what? Words are just words, no matter who's saying them. So whatever Nipsey Hussle said to him shouldn't have warranted the end of his life. You know, you just turned off a light bulb that was shining light on a whole bunch of people, man. My last question to you would be, what would be your message to today's youth? You know what the kids need to do? They need to um, tune in to, to Joy Ives' song, Streets Are Myth. And um, that's what I'm standing by right there. The streets are a myth. This is what I started telling the kids around my way that I talked to. Some of them try to stop me for a war story. Sometimes I give them a war story, but I give it to them with the, with the, with the true ending, not the, not the glorified ending. But anyway, this is my new thing that I'm telling the kids, man. Be like Nipsey. That says it all. Be like Nipsey. Be a person that helps other people. Be a person that's contributing to your community. Be a person that's about business. Be a person that's about longevity. Be a person that's about positivity. Let me also share that my Katumba was my role model. I wanted to be just like him. Do what he do. Get what he get. And for the most part, I did. Money, cars, identical lawyer, motorcycles, traveling. Um, the whole lifestyle he had, both Tito and I were able to obtain. But here's the mistake. The mistake was looking at him like a role model. Because what models could he give me, you know? Nothing but bad stuff. But I'm sharing this because a lot of us make this mistake when we're 15, 14, 16 years old, as far as young men. And the mistake is that we look for role models in the wrong places. For instance, my role model, was right at home and I never realized it until I got to the penitentiary. My role model should have been the strongest person that I knew, only I didn't know 
that they was that strong. Although it was clearly in front of me. And that person is my mom's. My mom's is the strongest person I know. My mom's is the most loyal person I know to me, my siblings. My mom is the one that trooped it with us through shelters, welfare hotels, other people's homes, other countries when we ran out of people whom we could stay with. Abandoned buildings, abandoned storefronts, basements. She, wherever we had to sleep, we slept, but we always slept clean. We never went hungry. And we always got up in the morning and headed out with her. Whether that was to a damn face-to-face -face meeting, or whether that was to school, or whether that was to go get some free breakfast somewhere, or wherever it was, you know? She survived it all. She survived her daughter dying so young. She survived her only granddaughter dying right after my sister 90 days later. She survives poverty. She survives my prison sentence. She done lately survived Hurricane Maria. Strongest person is usually in your household, man. Don't look outside for what you already have inside. Now, for anybody out there that need voiceover work, anybody out there that wants any narration done, any bilingual narration from Spanish to American or from American to Spanish, holla at the homie, man, underscore P-A-B-E-Y, underscore Pabe on Instagram. That's the homie, man. He does all the narration for the Goons of the Industry series, man. So if you need any voiceover work, anything of that nature, make sure y'all get at him. Pad Bay, underscore, P-A-B-E-Y. I thank everybody for the continued support. If you want to promote, sponsor, and or advertise your brand on For The Culture or InfoMinds, you can email us at For The Culture, the number eight, at gmail.com. Thanks again for the continued support.